I might have to go and edit room. I have news from the JV baseball game. They almost lost 22 to two. Almost? Yeah, it was sad. I was actually rooting for the other team at points. Hey, <laughs> okay, you're good to go. Thanks, Josh. All right, so I will go ahead and call us to order right at seven o'clock. Look at that. Uh, 7.01 now. <laughs> I'm still calling it seven o'clock though. Uh, and we are opening tonight with a public hearing. We have three donations to accept. Uh, and I believe these are all for the middle school. Is that right, Tim? Yes, that is correct. All right, take it away. <laughs> so we would like to thank uh, very much the Dorothy Byrne Foundation for three different grants. Um, they're all set up a little bit differently. Um, so you may remember that last year we got a grant to build an outdoor space, uh, partly as a classroom, partly as a bus shelter that we felt would be helpful for the school. We got a certain amount of money for that grant. Uh, then COVID hit um, and the cost of building materials went through the roof. Um, so we were not able to start that project. Um, and there were other, obviously other priorities as well. So. Uh, Greg and Brian Atkinson, Greg Stott and Brian Atkinson, who were sort of the leaders of the, the grant, wrote to the Byrne Foundation basically explaining, hey, this is why we haven't started it. And since the costs have gone up so much, uh, we plan to raise some funds so that we can complete the project. So um, that's all the letter said. So the, the Byrne Foundation came back and said, well, you need some more money, here's some more money. So they granted the $25,000 with an, another matching grant to increase the outdoor um, space that we have available to education at the Richmond School, which is great. We've been trying to think of things that we can do around our solar tracker for a number of years. We just haven't had the budget for it, but this was unsolicited money. So we are incredibly grateful for this um, and look forward to moving as quickly as possible um, to get everything built. Um, Cliff Harriman, who'll come up again in a second, has already solicited. We have like four or five different sets of plans generated by students for what we're going to try to put in around the solar tracker um, that they think would be effective as a, as a school setup. So that's the first grant. Uh, the second grant is a grant for Cliff Harriman. Cliff took over this year, as I'm sure many of you know, um, in the woodworking shop. Uh, taking over for Richie Starr, who had been the, I think, the sole proprietor of the woodworking shop at both Richmond Middle Schools for 43 years. Um, he ran a very particular type of program that was based on individual uh, skills, individual projects. Uh, Cliff has sort of shifted what he's doing to try to build more collective projects, and he found that he really didn't have uh, the tools necessary uh, to sort of, one, build those collective projects and two, sort of get students ready for what they would come in contact with if they were going to go into any kind of woodworking in a, in a more modern situation. So he had written uh, a grant to the Friends of Hanover Norwich Schools to buy a lot of tools that would allow uh, to have basically 20 sets of tools um, so he could teach beginning woodworking to all sixth graders and they would all have a plane, a chisel, et cetera. Uh, he then wrote a grant to Dorothy Byrne Foundation for the second half. So he could complete basically his revamping of the, the studio in one year rather than, you know, taking it out over three or four years. Um, so we think we're really excited about that as well. And then the third grant was a grant for the library renovation, which we have been pursuing for a number of years and we realize it's gonna be difficult within the current budgetary limitations. Um, and we did know as well that we would probably have to raise some money to match some of it. No one was gonna be able to come up with the full amount. Um, but the library is really not so much this year because of COVID, um, but is really sort of the, the heart of the Richmond School. It's where things start. It's where all the students, a lot of the students start their day. Uh, it's where we have a lot of students spend large portions of their day. Um, and we just feel that the ability to change these things will allow us to be adaptable and move forward. So that's another $25,000. And we have a plan to try to raise matching funds 
um, to get to the point where we can revamp um, as much of the library as we can going forward. We know at the base level, it's, it probably needs new shelves uh, and new carpet. So those that is written into part of the grant. So I'll welcome any questions at this point. Thanks very much, Tim. Are there questions from the board on any of these generous donations? All right. Seeing none, I will take a motion for the first, I think we have to approve them separately uh, per policy. So I will take a motion for the first donation, Rick. The board will uh, move to approve the donation with gratitude from the Jack and Dorothy Byrne Foundation, the amount of $25,000 for the RMS library renovation. Move to fundraise an additional 25,000 from the school district community to make the 25,000 matching pledge from the Jack and Dorothy Byrne Foundation available. Thanks, Rick. Is there a second? Ben? All right, and we'll do a roll call vote starting with Rick. Johnson, yes. Neil? Odell, yes. Tom? Candon, yes. Marcella? Blasi, yes. Brittany? Joyce, yes. Lisa? Christy, yes. John? Hunt, yes. Kelly? Percy, yes. Ben? Keeney, yes. Kim? Many, yes. And McConnell, yes. And I'll take a motion for the second donation. Oops, sorry, lost my Zoom screen. <laughs> Rick? Move to accept the donation from the Jack and Dorothy Byrne Foundation in the amount of $25,000 for fund increased costs for the outdoor pavilion to be constructed at Richmond Middle School as presented in the 12820 Dresden board meeting. Move to fundraise an additional 25,000 from the school district community to make the $25,000 matching pledge from the Jack and Dorothy Byrne Foundation available. Thank you, is there a second? John, and roll call starting with Rick again. Johnson, yes. Neil? Odell, yes. Yeah. Tom? <laughs> Andon, yes. Marcella? Blasi, yes. Brittany? Joyce, yes. Lisa? Christy, yes. John? Hunt, yes. Kelly? Percy, yes. Ben? Eni, yes. Kim? Hartman, yes. And McConnell, yes. And the third donation, Ben? Move to accept the donation from the Jack and Dorothy Byrne Foundation in the amount of $10,500 for retooling the woodworking classroom. Students and the teacher, Cliff Harriman, are collaborating with Cover Home Repair and Habitat for Humanity to building interior cabinetry, outdoor entry stairs, and more, and need new hand tools, handheld machine tools, and similar for these endeavors. Thanks, Ben. Uh, and a second from John. And I'll take a roll call vote, starting with Rick. Johnson, yes. Neil? Odell, yes. Tom? Candon, yes. Marcella? Iblasi, yes. Brittany? Joyce, yes. Lisa? Christy, yes. John? Hunt, yes. Kelly? Percy, yes. Ben? Eni, yes. Tim? Hartman, yes. And McConnell, yes. So thank you once again to the Byrne Foundation for all of their generosity. And I, I will note, I especially appreciate um, so many of the detailed responses in the gift letters. There's such an investment, not just in the schools in general, but in the actual projects, um, which is wonderful to see. All right, uh, moving on to agenda review. Are there, is there anything that the board would like to add or rearrange on tonight's agenda? Okay, seeing none. Oh, yes, sorry, Tim. Kelly, could I ask that uh, I think in the original agenda that Ellen Fisher was after the report and if we could move her forward so we could have the students speak as close to the beginning of the meeting as possible, that would be great. Yep, I think that's absolutely fine. Yeah, so we'll um, just bump the principal's report down so that they're right next to each other. Okay, super. Anything else? Okay, 
Um, so that will move us into public comment. So if there are members of the public that would like to comment on something not already on the agenda, now would be the time. I'll just remind um, members of the public that we will limit comments to two minutes and please ask you to state your name and the town in which you live. So I see we have Stuart Richards who would like to speak. So I will move you over. Stuart, if you can unmute yourself. You should be good now. Great, can you hear me? We can, yes. Good evening. So I'd like to, I'd like to uh, reiterate a request that I had made to the uh, Norwich School Board and it relates to transparency. So you can't see me or I, at any rate, I can't see myself and I also can't see the people who are in attendance. And I think it's important for the sake of transparency that everybody know who, who's part of the meeting and also to be able to see as if we were in the same room together to see each other. So I know that this is technically possible because my company has hundreds of people who attend a meeting at one time and you can see the participants and you can also see the people. And I think that, that that's an, uh, an important point. The second point I'd like to make, uh, and I hope that from a technical point of view, you, you simply just take care of it. It's, it's easy to do. So uh, second point is related to um, the open, well, it's the right to know law. And that relates to meetings that have been held where the public has not been able to attend. I tried to attend a, an SAU 70 equity meeting and I was asked to leave. And I just, I think that that's highly inappropriate and I think it's a violation also of the uh, right to know law. So I would appreciate your addressing that. And I also appreciate your listening to my comments. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Stuart. Are there any other members of the public who would like to speak at this time? All right, seeing none, we will move on to the report of our HHS Council Representative, Casey. Hi, it's nice to see you all. Um, I actually believe this might be my last meeting um, because the new leadership will be here next time. Um, so I'll be here, but I won't officially be giving you a report. Um, but in the past weeks on council, we have passed the freshman off campus motion, which allows freshmen to go off campus during their second semester. Um, that has not been signed by Principal Logan yet, but it has passed council and it passed um, with 30, um, 37 votes yes, um, one vote nay, and then one abstain. And then in addition to that, the new mascot committee, um, which is looking at the process kind of after it passed through council. Um, so figuring out the alternative design um, and also how to integrate that into our athletics. Um, and just around the school, that committee started meeting and had started meeting and they had elections for chairs for that committee. So, yeah. Thank you, Casey. Are there questions for Casey this evening from the board? Tom. I don't have a question for Casey, but first, thanks for your service, Casey. It's been great having you with us, even though we don't have a single in-person meeting with you. So, sorry, <laughs> come back next year. Uh, and I also wanted to just uh, pass along, um, I, don't know, I guess, congratulations. I'm not sure of the right words, but uh, gratitude for uh, Ben Wagner, your PR officer's uh, letter to the editor of, at the end of March. I think I don't think we've met since then, but it's a really nice piece and nice recognition of his uh, fellow council members. So just wanted to uh, recognize that as well. But thank you as well for your service, Casey. Thank you, Tom. And thanks for bringing up that letter. That's an excellent point. Any other questions or comments for Casey this evening? 
I know I have a, I have a freshman who was very excited to see that motion pass. So we'll see. There's fingers crossed in my house. I know. <laughs> yes, John. Tom, uh, Tom sort of stole what I was going to say a little bit, but I, I just wanted to also um, say thank you, Casey, for um, guiding through some, some really challenging discussions this year and, and doing that better than, um, well, I would say I did at times. Um, so thank you very much. Um, you, you really handled yourself really well in these meetings that I, I can imagine are challenging at times because I know I've struggled with them. So thank you very much for, for your service. Absolutely. I think we all echo those sentiments. Casey, you've done a wonderful job and represented your council very, very well. So thank you. All right. And with that, we will move on into um, our RMS presentations tonight. It's a, almost a vignette of sorts, right? With some really exciting news. So Tim, I will let you kick this off. Okay, I wanted to welcome, we, we have had just sort of a, a confluence of a number of events um, that have sort of dovetailed with what's going on curriculum wise, but uh, we wanted to start with something that actually started at a meeting of the school board uh, a while ago when there was a discussion of uh, House Bill or Senate Bill 544. Um, and our remote academy teacher, Eric Goodling, who I believe is here, um, had had his students as part of what it means to be a citizen, which is the civics lesson that they're teaching this year, they're exploring this year in the seventh grade, sort of look at the public meeting, um, had a discussion about what the bill meant. Uh, had, I'll let Eric explain exactly the whole, how the whole thing came forward, um, but it's kind of a, a uh, just a, a great example of how civic engagement can happen with students who are not yet able to vote. So I think we have, I know Eric is here and Eric, we have Carter, right? Uh, if they're, I can't see who's here, but if they're here, it should be Carter, so I think Lee Josh and Carter Lee. probably can move over. I'm assuming that Jeremy Eggleton is actually Lee Eggleton can be moved over. And who else? And Una Gleason, Josh, are the three students who are going to talk about what uh, what they did. There they are. I think I got them all. <laughs> yep. Awesome. Um, so it, it, Tim's right. It was at a school board meeting and you were mentioning HB 544. And um, teaching humanities remotely this year uh, has been really interesting and a lot of fun and has allowed for a lot of, um, well, creativity. And at this point, hearing the idea that HB 544 was there, having dealt with the origins of the constitution, the bill of rights, um, moving up towards the westward expansion and the, and the civil war and thinking in both a, uh, an through an equity lens, whose stories aren't being told, who's writing the history, where are we getting that from? Um, and trying to tie that all together with the idea of being an active citizen and participant, what better place than HB 544 in the language that was in there. Um, realizing, however, that that's an incredibly political topic, I went to my kids and asked them what they wanted to do. I, I, I let them know that there was a bill out there and asked if they were interested. And allowing for, uh, I, I used private chats and different ways to find opinions, not saying any, you had to be either one way or the other, uh, taking into account that this is a New Hampshire bill and we have students in both Vermont and New Hampshire. What do you do when there's a law in one state that's gonna potentially uh, affect your education when you're in another state? Univers as soon as they heard about it, every single student in the class said, yes, we wanna do something. So we took it upon ourselves to read through the bill, to break down the language, to look at the implications, to see what it meant. There are some clauses in it that seem per per perfectly reasonable uh, when you first read them, but then looking at the context of the whole thing together. Um, and it was, it was fun to kind of, for me, to watch ire raise, to, 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 as, as people understood what was going on, to see them get involved. And when we understood what it was, I asked them, what do you want to do? What's the next step? Um, and they came up with a plan. And the first step, Una. 
to you. Look at that. I caught her with a drink. I, that's my waiter training coming into, into, into play from back in the day. All right. Um, so I'm just talking a little bit about the process with writing letters and sort of what it was like. Um, obviously, as Mr. G said, um, he asked us, like, would we like to do it? Everyone said yes. Um, was, we, and then we read through the entire bill and we're able to give our opinions on like what we agreed with, what we were like, this is confusing. We wanna learn a little bit more about it. Um, so then we were like, we're writing letters. We knew that. Um, so we split up into two different groups, which were the Vermont people and the New Hampshire people, um, because the Vermont people were going to write to their Vermont representatives just to make sure they knew about it. And the New Hampshire people were going to write to their New Hampshire representatives to talk about where how they were going to vote about it. Um, so I am from New Hampshire, so I was in the New Hampshire group. And on the first day, we sort of just started off making a very, very rough draft, sort of just saying the basics, um, sort of two points of, from the bill, what was like in the bill, what we wanted to talk about, and just the introduction, telling who we are basics. Um, on the second day, we edited more and we talked about what more to add. We sort of just took everything we possibly wanted to add, put it in, and then was able to edit it and take out the parts that were just sort of us talking on and on for no reason. Um, and then uh, the next day, we were just, we got to write on our own time, our own letter. And we took our own thoughts since after class we wrote it by ourselves. We took our own thoughts and we talked about it the next day. Sort of just what we had written and took in, taken parts from our own writing and put it into the letter. And then by a couple of days later, with the help of Mr. Goodling, um, we had our final draft and one person from the group sent the letters out to the state representatives. Um, and within the next few days, we had responses from them, um, just talking about what they were going to do about it and thanking us for reaching out to them about it. Um, that's all I really have to say about it. So back to Mr. G. Unmute. Um, so the it was fascinating to watch them go through the process and really work together and and hone a message, craft a message to somebody that they wanted, you know, to, to watch their voices come together into a unified piece that they could send out. And getting the responses back was pretty amazing. Um, and 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 quick. We had some uh, email addressing errors, so we didn't hear back from everybody. But um, from the Vermont side, we got a wide range. Uh, Senator McCormick wrote a three-page manifesto on what it meant to be a, a citizen and to be involved. Um, and Tim Briglin wrote a go out and, and protest and sit on the lawns and, and do stuff. And um, Tim Briglin wrote back very short. He said, I loved it. I want to meet with you guys. Um, so it was really interesting. The kids were like, wow, Senator McCormick wrote this and, 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 and Jim wrote this and Tim only wrote one line. It was like, but that's the big one. Um, so I, I stepped in a little bit here and arranged for that meeting to happen. And we had a zoom class. We took one of our days and Tim Briglin joined us, uh, in class in zoom to talk about what it was like to be a representative and to the kids ask questions about, what next steps would be, and he gave advice, and that is where I'm gonna push it over to Lee to talk about that piece a little bit. Okay, so um, basically when we met with Tim Brigland, um, he talked, he, he basically gave us some information about what the Vermont legislature was going to do about the HB 544 bill. Um, and then basically, he, we asked him a few questions about what what we should do to um, keep on protesting, not just um, the House Bill 544, but other bills like it. Um, and he actually gave us a really great quote that they use in the Vermont legislature when it comes to passing bills. And it is, um, nothing about us without us. 
uh, so um, once we met with him, that spurred us to keep on going and we decided to write to the governor and the school board. Um, so um, we, along with that, we also uh, wanted to get the support of um, people from RMS, not just the, the RLA. So for that, we asked the student council so that, so over, so that, that would be over back to Mr. Redline. Thanks, Lily. Nice job. Um, and, and Una, sorry, I didn't get to say nice job to you too. You were awesome. Um, so the uh, really hearing from Tim and the encouragement to get your voice out there and amplify your voice and try and bring as many people as possible, sent the kids back to the drawing board to write up a petition that said, you know, and, and to express to people that uh, especially in a middle school sitting setting, we didn't want to peer pressure anybody into it. We didn't want it to be the cool thing to do. We wanted them to understand what was going on. So right at the beginning of the petition, there was, and the discussion was an encouragement to read the bill and make up your own mind before you sign it, not just to sign off on something. Um, we gave them a period of time and then, uh, well, we took it to the student council and Carter was our seventh grade student council rep from the RLA. It just so happened that right when the time came, she made the transition back to in-school learning. So who better to take the position from the RLA here to in-person student council? And she did just that. And that's my third and final presenter. So Carter, take it away. Um, so when we made, we made, uh, we wrote two, uh, things and information piece and a um, petition to take to the student council and um, I don't know what happened to the information piece but the one that went to the student council uh, I just asked them if they could um, all the student council reps if they could take um, the petition to their homerooms and give them a copy and uh then um as i went back in school just collected the um, i collected the i don't i think we also collected them and and then we sent them to the governor that's that's it and a school board. So thank you, Carter. That was awesome. And um, I just, I know I'm not supposed to gush, but I, can I gush for a second? It is so hard for these kids to come and speak in front of a group of adults in a school board setting. And that awesome, all three of you, awesome. Um, and the whole project as a whole, uh, they just did a tremendous job and it was fascinating for me. I, I just met these kids this year. So I don't know where they've been or what, how they've been, but watching them all, become beginning activists, to hear their voices out there and reach and learn from the people, uh, the legislators who said, get out there and do it and encourage them. And it has been just a fascinating piece, but like one of the top successes for me for the year so far. So they, they sent you a petition. I hope you've read it and, and um, will act appropriately upon it if it's still viable. So um, the one last thing we've got, uh, as I'm sure you know, the HB 544 didn't make it, but the language got stuck into HB 2, which passed the House and is now in the Senate. So we're going to look back on it in the Remote Academy and see if we want to go somewhere else with that and see what we could do possibly with the Senate and maybe petitioning the governor again. So it's not over yet. Thank you all for listening and giving us a chance to crow a little bit. Thank you, Eric. And thank you, Carter, Una, and Lee. You guys did a wonderful job. It's always the highlight of our meetings when we get to have students presenting. So thank you very, very much. Um, and before, um, before I take comments for this group, um, and we did, I, we did receive the letters. Um, Jay, can you just confirm that? We received the letters at the SAU, correct? That's correct. Yes. And um, I did just wanna confirm that this board um, put out a statement against uh, HB 544, which was um, sent on to our um, legislators and to the NHSBA um, and to the governor as well. 
Um, and so we definitely appreciate your involvement. We appreciate um, the time and the care and attention that you all took to participate in this process and get engaged. Um, hopefully someday you'll all be wonderful school board members yourselves <laughs> or even beyond school board. <laughs> we would love to see that. Um, so I would love to um, actually invite, if it's okay, if you guys have a couple more minutes, I'd love to actually invite Ellen over now um, and then um, ask board, member to, board members to save questions um, until we have heard both of the student presentations, if that's okay with you all. Yes? Okay, super. So um, Tim, I'm gonna go ahead and move Ellen over. And I believe it was Lucia Lauderhand as well. Yep, and Joshua Janice. Okay. And we will have, um, if you want me to share my screen, if you want to do that, can you allow that? I think I can. You should be able to. Okay. Let me get it up first. And Lucia Waterhand as well. She, she is there. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. And I just wanted to say just sort of as a, as a way here between Eric and um, Ellen, that to me, this is one of the things that has been a real plus for this year is that we've been allowed or we've allowed ourselves to sort of break away from what might be a standard curriculum and sort of examine areas that are really uh, important uh, to, to the students uh, and to everyone else in a way that sort of is much more in depth than perhaps it would have been. Uh, in the future. So I'm going to go ahead and see if I can. I think that's what I'm trying to do here. Are we good? Yeah. Can we hit present? Can we go into a present mode? Yeah, where's present? Where am I looking? Vendor view. Hmm? View, I believe. View. I can never find it. Upper right hand corner. Present. It's on the Got top it. right. There you go. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. First of all, I really want to thank you all for this opportunity uh, for our students to showcase some of their outstanding work. Um, this unit, uh, Founding Fathers and Slavery Bringing Forward the Unseen, really um, had its genesis last summer when um, Sarah Rooker from the Flow of History and Norwich Historical. Society and I would, um, on Fridays, we would sort of Zoom and brainstorm. And we had collaborated quite a bit in the past. And she said, well, what do you want to, you know, what should we do this year? And I said, well, I really, really, I just want to really bring slavery forward. I really, you know, I've been teaching it, but I'm just not really happy with, you know, um, the way it's been going. And I just really want to make it more real for students because, you know, with the whole 1619 curriculum, um, it, it is, it, it's such a foundation for our world and especially our country and what's been going on now. I just thought, I really want to bring it to the forefront. And so we kind of played around with the idea. And then over the course of the year, it started to evolve. And then uh, Karen Whitaker, who's one of our 504 ed assistants, came up to me in the hall one day and she knows that I like to use art in my lesson. She said, I just heard the most amazing <laughs> a uh, story on CBS Evening News about this artist, Titus Kafar, and what he does with primary sources and founding fathers and his artwork. And I'm like, I need to know about this. <laughs> so um, I learned about him and um, he became part of the lesson. So I, I won't go into too much more background, but um, I'll start with a little bit of an introduction. So we can move the slide to the next. There we go. So at the start of the year, students were introduced to what we call the great debate, um, which is the idea of America um, as embedded in these value tensions. And one of the value tensions is freedom versus equality. So we had been talking about this throughout the year. So this series of lessons really centers around this value tension of freedom versus equality uh, through investigation of primary and secondary sources related to our American presidents and founders who own enslaved people. So really examining that contradiction. Um, we then used the artwork of Titus Kafar as a model uh, for students to create their own interpretations of this value tension through art. 
And as Eric was saying, you know, bringing forward the unseen, um, finding out whose stories really haven't been told in our history, um, but also to be able to view history. And I heard this recently and I really liked it with 2021 vision. So in other words, understanding that the values that we have now, our social norms were not what they were um, in the 19th century and late 18th century. And we have, to, we have to really see these people through that lens. So the idea is not to condemn these people, not to eviscerate them, but to really understand that uh, the enslaved people in their lives were responsible for their political and economic privilege and status. This image here actually came from an article that we read. So it, it, this, this person on the right um, is actually a descendant of, Je of Thomas Jefferson. And they kind of dressed them in similar clothing to kind of show the contradiction. Part of our exploration was through primary source analyses. And so the right, we looked at the Pennsylvania Gazette of I believe it was July 10th, 1776. And what is on the front page, but the Declaration of Independence. And sitting in the, the on the same page in the right-hand column are advertisements for runaway slaves. So we, we felt, this is really a good example, you know, staring us in the face of this contradiction. So we dissected, we analyzed, we, we talked about this, um, again, through that lens of freedom versus equality. On the right-hand side actually is a page from Thomas Jefferson's farm book in which he lists the names of his enslaved people. Um, and I believe it had to do with the, the amount of clothing that they received each year or shoes, who got beds. Um, so he, he took meticulous, he kept meticulous records of all of his property and all of his holdings. And this was an example. Um, we then moved on to- uh, so Sorry, I'm trying to go backwards. My navigator here. Why can't I go backward? There we go. A little bit more. No, you're, you're going, there you go. Yes, thank you. Um, we then um, looked at the story of Ona Judge. So Ona Judge was uh, an, an enslaved person. Actually, um, she was the property of Martha Washington. So she was one of her um, dower slaves as they called it. We looked at the list of Washington, the actual primary source of the list of Washington, Washington's enslaved people and his wife's and she had more than he. And we uh, learned about this, this young woman who escapes and you know, talking about an act of courage to actually escape from the home, the White House effectively. Um, so Washington puts out an advertisement and this is the actual advertisement. And then we actually read this um, sort of fictionalized account of her escape, but she, she winds up in Portsmouth, New Hampshire which is also um, kind of a nice connection for us. So we read about her. Um, we learned about Billy Lee, who was um, Washington's valet, who he becomes very close to. And through that relationship, he, his own attitudes about slavery are reformed. Um, and then we also looked at some of the enslaved people that Jefferson, that were properties of Jefferson and um, Monroe as well. And we can go to our next slide. And this is um, Titus Kafar's interpretation, his portraits of Ona Judge and Billy Lee. We analyzed these in class. And this is, this is just classic Kafar. What he's done here, which is you know, so amazing. Here we have um, you know, a classic picture of Washington on his horse holding out his saber. And Kafar clothes him in strips of his own um, an actual primary source of uh, George Washington's own writing, his own record of his enslaved people. So these strips are actually um, from primary sources. And using these as our inspiration, our students created incredible works of art and I'm gonna have them talk about them. So Josh, would you like to chime in?
Josh, are you muted? Uh, no, I think, am I no, muted? No, you're good now, hey. All right. Thank you so much for being here, Josh. Yeah. So this is my project. It was, I named it The Real Foundations. At first, when the assignment was first published, I was think I was trying to come up with ideas of what to do for it. And so I was thinking as we looked at all the Titus Kafar um, portraits, I was getting ideas about adding sleeves to my picture. And so I kept thinking, and then previously, I had another math assignment, I did an architectural drawing of the Statue of Liberty. And so I got an idea of trying to evolve architecture and slaves into the same picture. And so I was thinking, and then, because the topic is with the slaves and we we're talking about Thomas Jefferson, I was thinking of maybe I could do the house of Thomas Jefferson. And so that's the outline you see here. And all the names inscribed are the names from the document or the page 52 of Jeff Thomas Jefferson's farm book of all the slaves that worked in the house of Monticello. And these people, they were, I, I see them as they may, well, they may not have only built the, like literally built Monticello, but they also were really the foundations of this country. Like all of the South basically relied on cotton and things like that. And they had dozens and hundreds of slaves doing the cotton farming and the cotton gin and all these inventions and new things coming. And so that's how I kind of, this is like a, a smaller picture, but then a bigger idea. Like as we have just the house in general representing the country in my eyes, and then we have the individual slave names, almost as if bricks to build the country itself, like to give it power and to tell that it wasn't just white people who have built the entire economy, but it's also the slaves who helped and that got the cotton that sold for the money and built the economy and grew all those things. And then, yeah, just, and then the one name inscribed at the top, kind of in the middle there, a little bit more bolder than the others, Sally. Sally Hemings was Thomas Jefferson's wife and they, he had children with her and that's is what started another previously in a picture showed with the Thomas Jefferson versus his um, descendant. And that's- So he, she, was, she was his mistress, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, she was his mistress. And what's, what's really strange about that is that she was actually his wife's half sister. It gets very confusing. And she becomes his mistress at the age of 14. I'm sorry, Josh, go on. Yeah. So there's explanation of that. And then the real foundations, it kind of, the title really just almost, if, if I think you could get the idea by reading the title just to kind of symbolize that it wasn't, it, it was these people not working together because they were enslaved, but these people, how much they worked and they shouldn't just be forgotten because the world is built now with supremacy of white people and things like that. But these people should be remembered that they helped build America. That's where most of these things came from. And so, yeah. Thank you. That was just beautifully expressed, so articulate, and really appreciate your coming tonight, Josh. If we go to the next, Lucia, are you with us? Yes. Hello. Hi, hey, Lucia. Uh, Lucia, I, I love the inspiration for this image, and um, please tell us all about this. All right. So I painted Martha Washington and her dower and seamstress, Ona Judge. When I started painting, I imagined the two as equals. Um, but as the, paint, as the painting progressed, however, I found that Martha was too equal, like too important. And Ona was just slipping away into the background. I then decided to draw cracks over Martha, not only to make Mar Ona Judge stand out, but also to symbolize that this perfect picture of Martha Washington, so regal, has fault and had an own slave, quite like a flawless mirror that has cracked. So perfect on the outside, but not so much within. 
I also read the Smithsonian Magazine, and in the March 2021 issue, there was an interesting article on one of Martha Washington's dresses, a beautiful taffeta with bugs, insects, and other critters embroidered, most likely by Ona herself, into the dress. The article inspired me, and later at school, I told Ms. Fisher about it. I decided to base Martha Washington's dress on the actual dress that she wore. I was also inspired by the artist Titus Kapar, who mixes media to highlight slaves' role in the lives of the founding fathers. That is where I got the idea of picturing Ona and Martha as equals instead of having Ona not be in the picture or be less than Martha. I found it interesting, really interesting to think about these people who are lost in the cracks of history. Thank you, Lucia. So beautiful. I just love that you got your inspiration from the Smithsonian. You also told me that you'd visited the Smithsonian and actually saw the dress there, right? So Lucia put her considerable artistic talents to use here and her incredible deep thinking. <clears throat> we have so many other incredible works of art that our students produced, but um, these were the two that I chose to showcase as, and you can probably see why. <laughs> Uh, the kind of thought that went into this work. And um, I think that concludes our presentation. So thank you, Josh. Thank you, Lucia. And thank you to members of the board. Thank you. And uh, Josh and Lucia, as we said with your classmates, a wonderful, wonderful job presenting. I know that it is so hard to get up in front of all of these people and share that not just share, but share personal work that you've produced. So um, wonderful, wonderful job. Thank you so much. Um, and with that, I will, um, oh, and we need to say congratulations to Ellen as well and her class on the award. So congratulations for that. Um, very, very well deserved. This is a fascinating project. Well, uh, so well, it deserved, my students deserve the award. I tell you, they did an amazing job. I, I can't disagree, it was, it was wonderful. Um, so thank you. Um, yes, Jay. Ellen, that's very modest of you, but I, I just wanna say <laughs> this isn't the first time you come before the board um, for this sort of recognition. And I just wanna thank you for going really above and beyond um, the depth of, uh, of learning that's obvious in the work of your students uh, is, is in large measure due to the work that you do as well. So thank you. And, and I, I want to say the same thing to Eric for um, for leading his students. Um, it's really very inspirational and what a great way to start a board meeting. I know. I, it makes me want to go back to middle school. Not, not the first time I felt that way, but <laughs> um, Kelly, I see your hand is raised. Yeah, I just wanted to add um, from the prior presentation, the point that was um, made about HB 544 and our board's unanimous resolution um, against that bill. We have also posted that on our uh, SAU 70 website. And one of the other recipients we sent it to was the New Hampshire School Administrators Association. So we really did, I think, cover a wide, wide array of um, recipients in that um, attempt. So that's all. Thanks, Kelly. Thank you for those clarifications. Yep. Yep. Yeah, thanks very much. Are there um, questions from the board for any of our wonderful presenters this evening or comments or curiosities? <laughs> Marcella? I have a, a question slash comment, which is I guess how all questions turn out to be <laughs> in meetings like these. Um, and I don't expect an answer, but I just have to say what's running through my mind as I'm hearing about this incredible work um, uh, Ellen Fisher, thank you so much. Um, Eric Goodling, thank you so much for the work that you've done and, and your students. It's just really inspiring and such a joy. I'm experiencing delight hearing about all the work that you've done, so thank you. And I just keep wondering if these, this kind of curriculum would still be permitted if um, 544 passes through in the budget. Um, and I'm wondering what we could do 
um, and what the options would be. Maybe Jay, you could talk about that. I don't know, um, but it would be such a shame to lose this incredible, um, rich curriculum. Sorry, Jay, go ahead. Sure. Yeah, it's it's hard to say. It's 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 speculation purely on my part, but. Um, I, I think there are some, some regulations that are pretty tricky to implement. And I don't know that there's anything that our students um, drew, painted about, or discussed that is controversial in any way. They, they were talking about our actual history. And I think HB 544 is aimed at what they called divisive and, and uh, controversial concepts. And I, I don't, I simply don't, I think we would make that argument all day long if, if we were subjected to any consequences if that law were to have passed, especially in this case. And I, <laughs> I'd love to show up at the state board with, with these students um, to, to speak as they said, um, you know, when, when, when laws like that are made uh, to regulate really to regulate their learning uh, without their consultation um, I think that's a very powerful statement to make and I think that, that we, we would have to take a, a field trip to Concord I mean judging from the students we've seen tonight I think they would be ready to join that <laughs> if such a field trip were offered thanks Jay um, it's a great question Marcella uh, John uh, my question is more um in normal times, uh, um, this art would be um, able to be seen by us by coming into the school. Is there a way to be able to share it all, whether it's uh, creating some type of slide of all of the art and being able to put it on the website? Because um, I think we just got a, a really small sampling of some fantastic projects, and I think there's absolutely a lot more out there, I would guess. So I think it would be really neat if there's a way that we could be able to see all that. I actually did. <laughs> For my own memory, I did take pictures and put them on a slideshow. Uh, I do have them. Um, it, they don't, you know, the images, for example, both with Lucia and Josh, my camera doesn't do justice to the quality of the artwork, but I'd be happy to share the slideshow with you. Not, not a problem at all. Thank you. That'd be great. I, I think I would go one step further and, and see if there is someone within the district with a fan, fancy camera that could maybe put together a really um, special presentation for this, because um, I, I think it's worth sharing with everyone. Thank you. I, I would love that for my, I'd love that for my students to have that kind of recognition because, um, and I told this to Tim, um, looking at the work, even listening to them today and they wrote reflections and some of them, some of them brought me to tears, um, truly. Um, the, the, the maturity, the sophistication, the, their eloquence, um, their creativity, you know, a picture is worth a thousand words, right? <laughs> Lisa. Yeah, hi, Mrs. Fisher, I'm Hank's mom um, from years ago. And um, John sort of stole my question, but I, it prompted an idea. Um, the Norwich Historical Society has a great art display space in their barn area. So when we are back in in-person times, um, if you do this again, I would really encourage a, a live exhibit in that space, um, maybe as part of this collaboration. So the community, the greater community could see it in addition to people that normally have access to our schools, so. Well, we're very lucky to have Sarah Rooker in our community. Uh, she's, she's been a source of inspiration to me for a long, long time. And, you know, she's the one who comes forward and says, what, what about this, this primary source? You know, and I'm like, yeah, <laughs> that'd be amazing. Let's bring that in. And so, yeah, that, that'd be great. Thank you for that. Thanks for those great suggestions, guys. Um, I see we do have one comment or question from the public. It's like maybe two. So I will move um, Stuart Richards over. And again, please state your name and the town that you're in. Stuart Richards from way across the river in Norwich. So it, this, is, this uh, presentation and the meeting is being recorded. 
And I wonder if it couldn't be excerpted, the portion that, that is of interest and that we're focusing on at the moment. Seems like you could put that on the website if you can excerpt, excerpt it uh, without too much of a problem. That's a great suggestion that might, at least as a start, it wouldn't show all of the work, but um, it, would, it would certainly be, I think, worth sharing. Thank you, Stuart, for that suggestion. Thank you. Allison. Hi. Hi. I'll lower my hand. I'm Allison Kapadia. I live in Hanover, New Hampshire, and I uh, wanted to uh, echo the um, support and how impressed I am with the work that all of these students are doing and these two teachers. And I just I can't help but see the connection between the artwork that really examines the um, structural inequality that this country was founded on and examines the humanity of, you know, the um, uh, powerful class defined by the white race at that time and the oppressed class at that time, which was black. And that still echoes today with HB 544, with the other classes work, um, with the more uh, powerful class trying to silence uh, voices, trying to examine the structures of racism that still echo today. And so I just wanted to point out that connection and I really appreciate um, the work that's being done um, in all of our school systems, I hope, but certainly demonstrated in these two classes today. Uh, and I'm really, really impressed by the teachers and the students that have um, spoken out about this. And thank you for the work that you do. Thank you, Allison. All right. I would, I would just like to add, I, I know we're sort of at the end, but uh, one of the reasons that we don't have all kinds of great pictures of everything that the, the students had done is that uh, Ellen did absolutely no publicity on this at all, right? It was only because I happened to have my desk down the seventh grade hall that I noticed all of these amazing, very nuanced and incredible pieces of work that students were presenting. Um, and say, hey, uh, what's this? Uh, same sort of thing with Eric. He's like, hey, we've got the, the Vermont uh, representative coming to class. Do you want to come meet him? I'm like, this is kind of a really big, cool deal here. Um, so I would just like to thank them again for the amazing amount of work that they've put into this um, in really fostering student voices, um, which is, it's, it's wonderful, but as a teacher, it's really time consuming and takes a lot of effort to do. And I would like to thank them for that. It's a lot easier just to stand up and talk um, and they haven't done that at all. And I think it, the school and the students and all of us I think are better for it. So I just wanted to make sure that they knew how much I appreciate what they're doing. Thanks, Tim. All right, so now unfortunately it is, it is my duty to move us forward. Everyone's going to be mad at me, but um, thank you again to all of you for taking the time to come here and share this work with us tonight. Um, it will definitely, I can promise, be the highlight of our evening. <laughs> thank you so, so much. We really thank appreciate you guys. it. Um, Josh, if you want to help me move people back over, I will let uh, Tim go ahead and do his update. And then <laughs> Jim, I promise we're going to give you a chance to talk tonight. <laughs> Okay, you've already uh, taken a lot of time on RMS, so I will go as quickly as possible. I, I first just wanted to thank the community and the SAU and whoever else came together to um, get us all our second shots on Saturday. Um, obviously, our, our reaction was a little bit more um, strident than we had hoped for, but uh, we are all walking around today sorely moving our arms, but uh, I think you can definitely feel the fe feeling in the building is picked up. Um, and we feel like we now can start planning uh, for the end of this year and next year. So thank you to everybody who helped make that happen. Um, as you saw in the two presentations, we've been trying really hard this spring to sort of value student voices um, and sort of uh, amplify them a little bit. Just some other quick highlights. So we had a march on Friday from that was organized by members of the student council. Um, as an awareness, a climate change awareness march. So we marched from the Richmond School to the Dartmouth Green. Um, and so they had come to me and said, we wanna do this. Uh, and then they undertook with John LaCrosse's help, but not a lot of it. So uh, they talked to the town manager, they talked to HPD, they made sure that everything was okay. So uh, we had that going on. Uh, it was a great success, although some students felt like 
they needed more. So it dovetails into May 5th is our annual walk and ride to school day. Um, we'll be along with the race school. So hopefully we'll have a lot of students taking part in that. You can definitely see the bikes are um, multiplying as the weather gets warmer, which is nice. Um, we have uh, also we, <laughs> our seventh grade classes convened their World Climate Summit this week. So we have students who have taken on all different roles, uh, different countries, and trying to figure out if there's a way that the world can get together to cut the uh, increase in temperature in the world by only two degrees by 2100. Uh, so it was very interesting to sit outside the class today and hear people arguing about uh, economics and policy and government and how entitled the first world is and um, all kinds of very, again, very nuanced uh, discussions that are going on. And uh, the seventh grade curriculum is, is really great at getting these students to argue in a good way with each other. We have our balloon launch is going to be next week. And I'm trying to think if there's anything else that's vital that we have since I've already taken so much of your time. Um, yeah, I think that's about it. We're going to start our transition meetings for fifth and sixth grade toward the end of the month. Uh, we will be able to have in-person tours this year, which I think will be a huge plus. Um, must have been a little bit terrifying for seventh graders from Marion Cross and sixth graders just to show up never having seen the building before. So we'll be able to get rid of that this year. Um, so, you know, that's, that's uh, and we're gonna plan something for our celebration for eighth graders. I talked to a number of eighth graders on the student council about what they felt the most important part of the eighth grade celebration was um, so that we can try to value that. We obviously can't do what we usually do. Um, and I don't think that the most important part of the eighth grade celebration is to hear me give a speech and then hand them a piece of paper. So they're gonna try to come up with something that's meaningful to them. And I think that that's fair. Uh, given that this year has been so bizarre so much. So thank you. And then I will, I will pass it over to Jim. Thanks, Tim. I, I can't believe that wasn't their first response when you asked them what the most important part was. <laughs> um, it looks like Ben has a question for Tim. Yeah, thanks, Tim. Quick question. For the in-person meet and greets for the building, are parents allowed with that or just the students? Uh, right now, it's going to be just the students. We're going to keep them cohorted as they are in the elementary schools. Uh, we'll allow the parents, obviously, outside. Uh, but I think the only people coming in the building, just so that we can maintain the cohorts um, going forward. So we'll have to have, we're having long discussions in the COVID task force about what we're going to do now as more and more adults get vaccinated. Um, but for right now, for everybody's comfort level, I think we're just going to keep it at that level. We also say, you know, this year we have people here in the summer. So if people aren't comfortable coming in a group, they can try to set up some sort of a, a tour of the building in the summer. We're amenable to that as well. Thanks, Tim. All right, Jim. Good evening and thank you. Um, and I'd, I'd also like to thank Casey for all her work with council. Um, and just to let her know, I did sign the motion this morning and it's going on through the other signatures. Um, you know, the, the council is a true strength of our school community, and it's been an honor to work with them. Um, everything they do has been professional. Um, it's been thorough. If you've ever been to a meeting, it's just amazing how it's run. So I, I can't thank them enough for all the work that they've done. Um, with Sage and Noah and, and Linda Adante, I meet with them weekly, and we, we have some really good conversations, and then the meetings are just wonderful. So I, again, I can't thank them enough for everything they're doing. Um, if you've seen my Friday update, you can see things are starting to ratchet up at the high school. We're getting towards the end of the year and there's a lot going on. Um, this past Friday, we celebrated Earth Day and the environmental um, club with, this, with the school and the staff and the, and the Earth Day committee, um, they planted over 200 seedlings um, in, the, uh, in the community. Um, it was nice, and in uh, and the update, I gave links to pictures that you could see, so I would recommend that you go there and you can see the, the work that the students were doing hand-in-hand -hand with the staff. Um, the end of the year calendar is in its final stages. Uh, in fact, we presented at the COVID task force today, and thankfully, there will be a, a prom. Uh, we're working out the details with that right now, um, and it's going to be, you know, practicing 
COVID protocols. It's not going to be the prom that we've that we've seen historically at schools, but there is going to be a celebration for the students. Um, and we're also working on the commencement ceremony, and that will be an in-person ceremony, and we'll be working on that, the details on that as we work through the next couple of weeks. We're meeting with, with our vendors next week, and we'll have a really clear picture of, of where we're going to be with those events towards the end of the week. Um, the master schedule is well on its way. I, I gave you some updates there. Um, the master schedule is a huge undertaking, and I can't thank Martha Campbell enough for everything she's doing with the master, working with, with Julie Stevenson and Andrea Johnston um, with, with getting the students scheduled in. And the, the new piece with that is we're starting a new schedule next year. So they're weaving the new schedule into this master right now. Um, so I'm, I'm confident it's going to work. I, I met with Martha yesterday and, you know, all systems are go right now. They're going to start loading the students into the schedule towards the end of this week. So we'll know exactly where we stand. Um, there's some parent workshops coming up, um, both uh, district wide and then school school uh, based. I mean, that's in the uh, in the update also. Upcoming dates, um, we have our equity trainings. Um, they're coming to an end on May 12th for the high school. Um, our May 17th is, is a teacher in service that we swapped with our, with our March date. Um, and that's to prepare for the, what we're going to call May intensive this year. And Matt Prince is working really hard on that. On the 26th, we're going to have a staff training and a discussion on the new schedule, the new bell schedule. And this is all on the calendar. Um, the CPP, I, I believe I mentioned it last month about how there's been a lot of discussion about the decision making process at Hanover High School. Um, it was one of it was a it's, a it's a challenge when you look at it. And somehow we have to start documenting what each committee does and the, the process that each committee is going to use during their meetings. Um, I put a copy of the presentation there. It was a, a really good discussion that we had at the staff meeting. Um, last week, it was probably an hour and a half long. Um, we sent a, a survey out to the staff afterwards, and it's basically unanimous that they want us to continue the work that we're doing. Um, so we'll be continuing that work as we work through the school year. Athletics, athletics is uh, full, full steam ahead. I can't thank Megan enough. Yeah, she's she's challenged. You know, everything's outside, but we're still getting snow. We're still getting rain. Things are freezing. Things are thawing. So I can't thank her enough and the buildings and ground folks for everything that they're doing to keep our fields uh, usable. Um, things will be wrapping up for that May 28th. Um, track ends the 21st, and then the track championship is the 29th, and then the playoffs start on the 31st. So we're in the, the full uh, fourth quarter swing here. And I, I, again, I want to thank everybody for everything they're doing. The staff is working really hard. Um, and we're going to round out the year on a positive note. So I want to thank you. Thanks, Jim. Sorry, I lost my Zoom screen again, looking at documents. Um, are there questions for Jim? Rick. Uh, Jim, could you did you state that the freshman off campus second semester was approved or is it still pending? Second semester, yes, I I approved it. I think the parent has to approve it and sign off on it. It's not a blanket ticket for the students to leave campus. The parent still has to approve that, and there's conditions with that. They have to be in good standing as a student. Can I just say that it's very funny because my class was the class that it got it revoked. So it's only taken this long for them to re put it back in. So, Tim, did you have anything to do with that? No, no, it was not me. It was all the other people. Yeah. Yeah, they just pulled the plug. Nope. Ben, do you have a question? Yeah, two small ones for Jim. Um, when you mentioned prom, is, is prom going to be outside? And then that's the plan. That's the plan right now. They plan on, in fact, that's where we're going to be meeting with the vendors next week. They plan on putting up two tents on the field. Um, and one tent is going to be for dancing. And uh, right now that's the plan. And then there's going to be another tent with, um, with tables and chairs. 
and they're talking about having food vendors come in um, and so that we're not going to be having food tables inside the tents under the tents the students are going to go to the, the, the food trucks and, and they're, they're working out the details right now but that's the the plan right now um, okay great and I have a second question if that's okay Kelly um, for the uh, athletic participation breakdown by boys and girls, is that fairly similar to the demographics of the school as a whole? Referring to your document? Yeah, yeah I, I would say it, it might be a percent higher or lower, but yeah, basically we're 50 50. And yes. Thanks, Ben. Kim. Sorry, Jamie, didn't see your hand. I'll come back to you in a sec. Kim, go ahead. Thanks, Jim. Just uh, kind of a follow up uh, to Ben, and I'm assuming this is the case, but I just want to make sure we are following town ordinances when we're thinking about all of this and we're getting the appropriate approvals. Jamie's nodding yes, so I just wanted to make sure. Yeah, we've run everything. I, you know, I can't, you know, thank the the COVID task force enough for the, for everything that they're doing with this. Um, everything is vetted through them, and if there's any questions at all, it. it it goes right up the, the ladder to get um, answers. Um, but yes, the town's been involved in this. Um, yeah, everybody's aware of what's going on. In fact, uh, Jamie's uh, staff will be at the meeting next week just to make sure everything is gonna go okay with the, with the facilities aspect of it. Great. Um, Jamie, did you have anything to add to that? Or is that what you were gonna? No, that's what I was going to say. Everything's vetted through the COVID committee. Awesome. Thank you. Ben. Thanks. And in follow-up to that too. So since it's prom, I'm assuming the vast majority of the people there would be seniors, which can theoretically get vaccinated right now. Is there any tracking of that or potential discussion of requirements? Yes. So that, that came up today in the task force, uh, in fact, uh, with the students, Candace Natty gave, a, gave a, I guess, a real quick overview of students that are out getting vaccinated. Um, and she feels that a lot of the students are gonna be vaccinated for the events, for the end of the year events. Um, I don't have the, I didn't write it down when she was talking about it, but I'm certain that we can help get, you know, some of the numbers for the students because they're being released to get the COVID shots. I think she said close to 200, either already yeah. vaccinated or uh, are gonna be out the next couple of days getting vaccinated. And we have requested, right? I don't think necessarily required, but requested that um, students let us know if they've been vaccinated. Is that right, Robin? Yes, that's correct. We are tracking that, so. We have a good indication of how many students are getting vaccinated. And I imagine most of them are telling yes, us that they've been I, I vaccinated. Have five students in yes, <laughs> they are. People in have hopes. been really good about it. Well, in hopes too, I, I five, think that it's going gonna... to. Go ahead, Jim. I was saying I had five students in my office this afternoon and they were doing like the vaccine that they got and they were happy. Um, I just hope that they're still. Um, cautious with what they do. Uh, I think that message is going to go out this week from Candace. You know, even though you got the vaccination or the vaccine, you know, you still need to be cautious out there. Definitely. Are there any other questions for Jim this evening? All right. Lots of exciting things as we head into this last part of the year. So thank you, Tim. Thank you, Jim. Um, again, we're all so grateful that you guys have kept everything going this year. So um, thank you for that leadership throughout the year. All right, and we will move on into our discussion phase of the meeting. Uh, tuition rates. Jamie? Sure, it's uh, posted there. It's been updated. We look at it early in January when we do our budget projections and then it's updated after all the voting's done. So it's been updated and those are the rates for this year. Any dramatic changes we should know about from in the updates? No, okay. No. All right, any questions on the tuition? Okay, we will be asked to approve that. So 
All right. Topic template for subsequent year meetings. Um, you guys have access to that. Are there, we don't need to look at it or to discuss it at length right now, but are there any um, things that jump out at you off the top of your head, things that we may have missed or? Yes, Kim. Just looking at, at my notes, I think, um, I guess a, a question really, do we still appoint coaches on the top, topic template? I thought that wasn't something that the school board did because we look at the teachers. But I I thought there was a, a the policy change in that. I, I don't know if anybody can help me with that. That's a good question. Um, Jamie? We had a discussion about this and I, I wish we had reviewed that with Amy, but we, and I may need to get back to you, but, uh, and Jay may have more information on it as well. Um, we had this, I think they still come to you for review uh, because they do work with the students and, um, you know, and because sports is such a, you know, hot topic sometimes. Um, I do believe they still are supposed to come to you for review. I'm not sure that we, uh, require a formal vote. Kim? Okay, I, did, I just have a memory of striking coaches from a policy and approving that, but I unfortunately I can't remember which three <laughs> acronym that was. Kelly, yeah. can you see my hand? Yes, Jay, I can see your hand. I'm Jay, really sorry, ahead. folks. I'm, I'm having internet trouble. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, we amended, we, we revised that policy to comply with state law and the board is not required to uh, elect coaches. Um, we certainly could if you want to see a list. Um, we could certainly provide that if the board really wanted it, but it's, it's, it's now no longer part of our policy. I think Kim's point was that we probably can take it out of our uh, topics right. template. Uh, Rick? Yeah, so if we're going to try to update this june it says apple computer lease if applicable what is that jamie or josh <laughs> i just have to unmute sorry i was reading board docs too at the same time um um that's because apple leases used to be done uh, historically for three years uh, and if you enter into a lease over a certain dollar amount, remember, I think it was $125,000, that the board needs to be made aware of it. So it's to remind us if we enter into any multi-year leases that are above $125,000 to notify the board that we're doing so. Okay, Kim, did you have another question? did um the only thing that and it might just be my fuzzy memory is at the last i think um one of the last months it says provide board with principal evaluation surveys is, is that done and i just haven't been to that meeting that that's occurred or am i just not remembering that is that something we should so that's a, a good question um i don't that's, honestly, I'm not remembering that either. Jay, do you have a recollection of that? Uh, I, I'll have to go back and, and double check to see which yeah. ones I've, I've done so far, but, but um, I'm about a month behind on evaluations as it stands now, so. I think, yeah, Neil? Um, I know that there's some discussion uh, with NHSBA as to when the delegate assembly is gonna be for the upcoming year, but we might wanna add a placeholder um, either in September or December um, for reviewing the resolutions. Okay. Yeah, and I know there are similar discussions on, uh, for NHSBA, right? Yeah. Yeah, because we, we did kind of miss that this year. Um, Kim, didn't mean to zap on your question. I, I think we'll look into it um, and we can make updates. Rick, did you have another question? I'll take that as a no. All right. Any other questions or comments on the template at this point? Okay. Um, and I don't think that we are approving that this evening, though. No. So we can make some. Uh, we can make updates to that, um, and it will be up for approval, I believe, next meeting. 
All right, um, curriculum update. Well, it's exciting to see the curriculum update on the agenda and not COVID committee. <laughs> and I actually did have time over while people were on vacation to move away from COVID for a little bit and start working on some curriculum. So I have a template that I've put into place and um, I started scheduling times over the summer, the last week of June and the two, two weeks, the last two weeks in July. So I've asked for volunteers from all of the schools to sign up if they're interested in working on curriculum over the summer. And I've had many teachers respond to that. It will be um, volunteer, so it will be paid a track one, step one. And I'm going to work with each of the groups. I, I'm starting in grade level and subject area teams. And so I'm just looking right now, Ryan has developed a spreadsheet for me. So I'm looking at how many people are interested how much money we have to spend on it and um, looking at when people are available. So I'll be setting that up over the next two weeks. Everyone had to respond to the email by this past Friday. And then I'm also looking at, I've developed a calendar of release days for next year to continue with the work and to work with, again, grade level teams, I'm doing some combining. So we'll have the sixth grade teams at Marion Cross with the sixth grade teams at RMS, um, you know, and again, some of the grade level teams at each of the schools, and then some crossover between elementary and middle and middle to high school. So it's exciting. I feel like, you know, the process will be underway soon and, um, and we've got some work ahead of us, but I think it will be good work. So I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thanks, Robin. I know we're all excited to see this, this get back up on the agenda as well. So mm -hmm. thank you for leading the charge on this. Um, are there questions for Robin? All right, and I know this is something that we will be looking at as part of our, um, hopefully or potentially part of our retreat. Um, but I think also um, a big component of our strategic plan. So um, we'll obviously be talking more about all of this in coming meetings and um, as we get into more detail. So thank you. Um, and policies. Ben, do you want to lead this off? Sure. So the policy committee now consists of Brittany, Garrett, and myself. And we have three uh, first readings tonight. The first one is a required one about advanced coursework and advanced placement. The policy uh, committee mostly discussed whether this would still work for Dartmouth as well as other local colleges to the area. And with its wording, we believe it does not change uh, current practice. And I don't believe we had any edits to suggest on this particular policy. For the conflict of interest, um, this, is, this is a continuing discussion. This is a new policy, though, and it, it well, I should say it has been discussed recently. It is up for revision. There was some wordsmithing on the number 13 nepotism, which also prompted some discussion that might come up at the next Norwich board meeting if it hasn't yet already. So Norwich members look forward to that. And um, lastly, EBCG on communicable and infectious diseases. I don't believe there was substantial change on this one either. It's just some clarification or what diseases it did and did not cover. And that one is also a, uh, that is a recommended policy. And we're happy to take any questions anyone has on any of them. Tom. Uh, thanks to all of you uh, serving on this committee. I know it's a lot of work. The question I have is related to the policy that's titled the advanced placement courses, Ben, it's, um, and specifically with regard to the STEM classes that uh, it references there. I'm just wondering how that is going to be considered with regard to the fact that we're members of the Hartford Area Career and Tech Center that has a STEM program as well. Is there some conflict or some reason that students would go to the New Hampshire Community College program over the STEM program that's offered by the Tech Center? Can I answer that? Okay. Um, 
it's from our read of it. No, there are several qualifiers throughout the document that I think leaves that location open for use. At least that's how I read it. Um, would you like us to make that more explicit? I guess I'm just interested in whether students, so do they have the opportunity of choosing one STEM program over the other? Is that what that opens it up to? Yeah, I don't think there is a requirement of um, order or priority. I think as long as it's discussed and agreed to at the, at the administrator level, I don't anticipate that being a problem. Uh, Jay or Garrett or Brittany, did you have any differing opinions on that from your read? Yeah, I think that's how it stands currently, Tom. Thanks, Ben. Um, one question I had on the same policy actually is um, just curious. So we don't have AP courses, but we have advanced coursework, some of which um, permit students or, or enable students to be able to take an AP test if they so choose at the end of it. Um, many choose to do that. I'm curious um, if you guys have talked about how that fits into this policy. If, you know, if a student came to their counselor and said, no, I want to be in an AP course, um, would, would they, would this policy essentially allow them to say, I don't want to take the advanced or the honors section that that isn't an AP course. I want to take an AP course with that title. Have you guys gotten to that kind of detail on this yet or? I don't, I don't think we did since an AP course would be taught at a, at a different high school rather than a college level course on technically mm -hmm. so that did not come up. Okay. Any other questions on any of these policies? Neil. Um, a question on the conflict of interest policy. Okay. Um, and when I read through it, so, um, cause I know that we've gone through this a few times. I see a paragraph one defines um, conflict of interest. And then if I'm reading, and maybe it's just my interpretation. So paragraph two then defines, I guess, what I would consider like another level of personal or professional interest um, that doesn't seem to be encapsulated in the original conflict of interest designation. Um, and so I'm wondering if there's a, a difference there that was intentional um, and then the second thing is then with that, then it seems to me that paragraph two and item 11 kind of set two different standards. So I'm just, I'm comparing them. Um. So Neil, just to clarify, your question is basically direct versus pecuniary benefit. Um, yeah, so we seem to, I mean, we have a definition for conflict of interest established in that first paragraph, mm -hmm. but then the second paragraph talks about a board member that has a personal or a private interest in a gotcha. proposed matter. And that's not, I mean, I don't know if that was supposed to be considered pecuniary as well, or if that's just a personal or a private interest. If it's a if it's a different it, it, it is separate um we did not alter the the first two paragraphs to my knowledge uh in this policy wherever i agree with your point those are two different things and i think that's why are they are distinguished in the policy um yeah I don't... and then so if that's the case then i think then we need to i think we might benefit by reconciling the two because if you look at paragraph two it describes what a board member is supposed to do. Um, and paragraph 11, or at least item number 11, I, I would interpret 11 to apply to a direct pecuniary interest. And so I just wonder if we could benefit maybe from simplifying things a little bit, or at least coming to one singular definition and then have all of the points apply to the definition. I would point out that that number 11 does distinct, does directly say pecuniary interest. Um, so it is specific to that. And I think it just kind of goes between something that should be reported or something you don't talk or you, you know, you, you don't vote, you don't participate in conversation versus a, I don't want to say punishable, but an actionable conflict of interest as pecuniary in, in nature. And I agree, it's a little fuzzy there. And I think maybe we can reconcile that back at the committee if that's what you're hinting at, I think. Yeah, I, I just wonder if you ought to 
discuss it maybe a little bit more and and, and just see if it makes sense. Sure, we can take that back. Um, uh, Richard and Lisa, do you have similar comments on this policy? Um, no, mine was on the contagious diseases. Okay. Uh, so uh, with the personal matter or, or whatever it's worded, personal interest. Mm -hmm. so are we talking if a board member has a child in one of the schools that we're voting on something that that's personal because it's one of our children? That was one of the fuzzy issues I think actually came up a couple of years ago. There was a yeah. similar discussion. And like I said, this one came to us and the, the language was as is for the first two, we did not change it. Um, so I think that could be a possible example, but like you, like we've indicated in previous meetings, you know, that's something called a modifiable factor where someone's interested in now, they may not be next year or not. So that one's, I think that specific example is quite fuzzy. So, I mean, it could be that, you know, if your kid is the captain of the team versus I'm interested in the sport, you know, there's different granularities there that would have to be probably at the individual discretion of the board member, I think, to declare it or not. That's my personal opinion. I will, sorry, I'm going to chime in for a second just to say that I agree it's a little, um, I would feel more comfortable if that second paragraph was clarified a bit more just because it then goes on to say that you will not deliberate, will not vote, will not attempt to influence, etc. And, you know, I, I just think, for example, I'm a French professor, right? So one could say that I have a personal interest in languages or in French. Um, and so that I, I think it is perhaps worth clarifying. I know it's not the first time we've yeah. <laughs> kicked this one around. Well, I would so. say we could certainly discuss and like, you know, we can think of, I would think probably fairly easy examples for yes, obvious conflict. Yes, obvious, not a conflict. Then there's that fuzzy middle, which yeah. is always the bane of these types of policies. And I'm sure we can come up with all sorts of examples. Right. Um, so it is, it's hard. I think we all agreed something like this needs to be on the books, but how specific do we get when inevitably there'll be some, I don't know, type issue that comes into play? Well, we can definitely uh, wordsmith it a little bit and bring it back to you guys. And perhaps it's it's just a question of um, we'll disclose such interest to the board and then cutting out those prescri prescriptive actions, right? Like, will not deliberate, will not vote, pending, you know, allowing the board to sort of decide is it appropriate or not. And I thought that that's might what, be solution. I thought that's what we had arrived at a year ago that we were going to do pecuniary was clearly a conflict of interest. If it's a personal or private matter, you should disclose and but you're still allowed to deliberate and vote. Because you get into the, you know, a sports a sports team when we're talking about putting new turf down, your kids are playing on that turf you probably are going to be uh, under this rule precluded from weighing in or voting. And I bet you a lot of the school board members have kids that play on the turf field. So I think, I think, I think it's a clear black and white line for pecuniary interest or direct pecuniary interest. The other ones should be just disclosed and acknowledged. Yep, and I, I remember a similar conversation. And it's, like I said, it's one of those things where I, I could see counter arguments to your specific example, and that's okay. There's always going to be things where there's going to be some slightly different disagreement. That's why it's a conflict of interest. Some people would interpret it as that, some people would not. And the other thing, too, is I actually don't really know why this came to the policy committee right now, because I also thought it was somewhat finalized about a year and change ago. So I can ask Ryan um, and Jake and Chime and if he knows uh, why it came up specifically now. And I know that one of the questions that remained at the policy committee level was, what do we do when one board member thinks another board member does have a COI and the, that board member is not saying anything right now? You know, like, do you quote, call out the board member? Do you kind of do a light elbow to the side? You know, like, what do you do in that situation? I don't think we came up with to a, a, a conclusion that could be reliably done because these things are challenging by their very design. Um, I'm, I, can we skip to Garrett since he's on the committee? Maybe I'm, I missed something. Yeah, thank you. I had seen his hand pop mm -hmm. up there, but yeah, Garrett, did you want to add something? You know, just saying, I, I think that Rick's point is why that second paragraph's there to Neil's question. So I think what we probably need to go back with Ben is 
maybe tone down the second, keep it, keep the second paragraph separate to Rick's point, but tone it down. Cause I think what we were struggling with during the policy committee was, is we just really wanted to make sure that if there was any sort of issue like this, that at least people, you know, volunteered and said that I'm conflicted. And then basically, I mean, usually, usually the, I think what people were thinking was, is that then they would preclude themselves from voting, right? And if, if they would raise their hand, but I think unfortunately this means that you have to voluntarily recognize when you might have this issue. So that, that's why this was such a difficult one to figure out. Because to Ben's point, you can't, you, <laughs> it's hard to just make blanket rules on everything. Cause you just, you know, there's a lot of gray area there to your point. Like if my, you know, if my son rose on the crew team, does that mean that I don't vote on, you know, buying a new boat for the school? I, I don't know, right? Like, when's that stop? That's the, the, those are the questions that we just couldn't answer. So it sounds like you guys will take a second look at that piece just to kind of try to uh, refine Yeah, I think, we, I think what we do, if it's okay with the board is I think, and Ben, I think we keep that second paragraph there because to, to, to um, Rick's point, that's not a pecuniary to topic. And, and I think we tone it down now. We basically you know, say that uh, the board, people, sh you should notify them if you believe that you've, you know, that there is a conflict of interest and then kind of take appropriate action. Yep. And so Tom, since, or not, I'm sorry, not Tom, Garrett, since this would be, what's being discussed would be a, a substantial change to the text so we take it back to the policy committee level anyway. Yeah. So I think we're, we're all in agreement here that we can finesse this a little bit more. So we will bring it back to you guys um, either at the next meeting or the meeting thereafter. I know our, our schedule for the next policy meeting is next week and we're already fully booked. So it might not be the next Dresden, but we'll bring it back at some point. Thanks, Ben. Lisa, <laughs> thanks for being so patient. Oh, no, no worries. And I apologize, I, I can't find specifically um, what triggered me about the, the infectious disease policy. Mm -hmm. um, but I worked with AIDS patients in the late 1980s because I am that old. And there was something about this policy brought up some anxiety for me. And I think it also combines with how hard it was to keep people's COVID status secret as COVID cases popped up in this community. And Again, I apologize, I can't find specific language that just sort of made this feel a little big brother like, um, if it's boilerplate language and it's what we have to do, I understand and I understand the intent behind it, but there was something in there and I'll try to find it and give it to, to the policy committee members um, about what just sort of made me uneasy, but it, there's just something about the way it's phrased made me a little uneasy about stigmatizing people for health conditions, which I know is not the intent of this policy, but I'm afraid it might be an outcome. So again, I apologize for no specifics, but I just felt the need to say that. Thank you. I, I would guess, Lisa, and you can tell me if I'm wrong and then we'll just move on, but the word exclusion, I think can sometimes be a, you know, exclude, and, and it's meant in a physical sense of, you know, physically excluding um, for a health reason, right? But that, that word exclusion, right. I think can be. It, it brought up images of Ryan White in Indiana in the public schools. And I just, yeah, so that, that could have been it, Kelly. Um, thank you. Ben. Yep, uh, great point, Lisa. I would wanna point out a couple of things. This is a proposed policy. It is not uh, required or even recommended. Um, so we have that in terms of whether we take action on it. In terms of the language, it is boilerplate. Like I said, we did not end up changing anything, although we went through it with a fairly fine tooth comb. And what the, I believe the intent of the policy is actually get away from any of your concerns saying the student should not be excluded based on this, this, and this. We will, provide, we will give privacy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I agree with you that, you know, when I first read it, like skimming, I think, ooh, um, but I believe its intentions are good. And we all read through the language, didn't find anything that was inherently problematic. And I believe this policy largely does what I would say is the right thing. 
although you know the there were several times when I stopped and were like does that mean what I think it says and we believe it does Thank you. Yeah, I, again, I, I probably only read it once. Um, this is my fourth board meeting of today. So um, I didn't have a lot of time to go back and reread stuff, but um, I appreciate that. I, and I know that the intention is good, but there was just something about it that increased my anxiety. So thank you. Garrett. Yeah, again, Lisa, I think we, all, we kind of all read it at, at first and asked the same question, where did it all come from? Um, and I will tell you that I think we got more comfortable with the policy when you scroll all the way down to the decision section, which is where really the meat is. And basically my conclusion was, is that at that point regarding students, it's up to the nurse and then principals and regarding employees, it's up to the, um, superintendent or designee. So if you, I think those Romanesque ones and twos basically take all of these points that you're making and kind of at least give someone at least a decision-making power whether or not someone should be in the school or not, right? If they've got a communicable illness. So I think that's where we came down on this is saying it's not just outright excluding anyone that's got this. It comes down to giving these people the decision-making power regarding students and employees. Yeah. Hope that helps. Ben. Yep. And it also makes clear, Lisa, that it's erring on the side of inclusion unless there are very specific contagible reasons for not doing that. So it, it's very cautious in that regard. Yeah. Maybe I just need to start with the end, move the end up, <laughs> and then <laughs> reverse it. Well, I think the policy committee, I think I can safely say that if we were writing this from scratch, we would write it very differently. But it, as a template document, it is, we believe it is sound. Thank you, guys. Thank you. And as I think it was Tom earlier said that this is a ton of work. We all know how much work goes into these policies. So thank you, guys. And then you get to listen to us nitpick them apart. So we really do appreciate the work that you do and go back and do again. So thank you, guys. We just hide our pain when there's comments. It's okay. <laughs> All right, um, moving on to business requiring action. Um, I don't think there's anything in here that needs to be pulled out uh, unless anyone sees anything that needs to be pulled out or highlighted before we vote. Lots of investment policies, deputy treasurers, etc. School calendar, anything to mention about that, Jay? before we approve the school calendar. We decided not to do anything with a voting day. Is that correct? That's right. Okay. So, so as we discussed in the Hanover meeting, the calendar, we, we think we've got it in a very stable format at this point and don't anticipate any changes, but um, we, we always reserve the right that if something should come up that we'll, we can always bring it back to the board for a revision. But as it stands now, we feel confident in the calendar. Okay, super. Um, Anything else to call out, Ben? I had a brief question, but it's, it's not related. It was more whether with the school day off of yesterday, does that change the calendar for this year yet? Do we know? I don't think we know that yet. I think it's gonna depend on hours. Okay, I don't know if you. Right, we, we're, we'll, we'll have to recalculate hours. We have two days um, at the end of the year where students aren't in, it, aren't in attendance, but teachers are. So that's always our challenge is balancing the, the requirements under the contract and under law uh, for student teacher days. And we think that worst case scenario, we'd have to offer instruction for one more day. Um, the last day for students is on a Monday. We'd probably have to offer instruction on that Tuesday if, if we aren't making the hours, but we'll have that calculation soon. All right, I will take a motion for the consent agenda. Kelly? Uh, yes, uh, let me get back to it. Mm -hmm. Every time I click off, I'll lose the page. Um, move to approve items B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, and J by consent. Thank you. It always reminds me of an episode of, uh, I seem to be freezing, great. 
Did that come through? Kelly's frozen. I'm back. Can you hear me? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Excellent. I thought it was me. No, no, that's all me. Is there a second? <laughs> Probably 70 by now. John, thank you. And I will take a roll call vote. Ben? Any yes. Rick? Yes. Johnson, yes. Kim? Hartman, yes. Kelly? Percy, yes. Tom? Candon, yes. Brittany? Joyce, yes. Uh, Neil? Odell, yes. John? Hunt, yes. Marcella? De Blasi, yes. Lisa? Christy, yes. And McConnell, yes. All right. And we, with that, will be, oh, yes, moving on into committee reports. Sorry, I was going to move us right into non public. Um, very important committee reports. <laughs> Um, are there any updates from committees? I've heard a lot from policy already. I think you guys are probably good. Yes, John, athletics, yes. Hi, thanks. Um, yes, the Dresden Athletics uh, Advisory Committee met uh, yesterday morning, um, and the bulk of our discussion surrounding um, fundraising and booster clubs. Um, we are in the process of developing a survey um, that was sent a few years ago, but we felt um, the need to redo it to coaches um, as well as to, um, to the um, booster clubs to get a better handle on what they're specifically raising their funds for, um, kind of how much, you know, what's the extent of their, um, how much their budget relies on booster clubs, um, you know, what, what do they need to, to successfully run their programs. Um, we're doing this so we can get a better handle and be able to better support um, each program and the, the booster clubs uh, moving forward. Um, so we had a big discussion on that and the survey is being put out within the next couple of weeks. Um, so the, the hope would be we'd be able to, um, at our next meeting, which is May 20th, be able to discuss those findings and be able to start to develop kind of some parameters around how booster clubs work um, to make sure everyone's following uh, policy within the district. Um, we also discussed fundraising on a larger level um, that kind of held off a little bit in terms of, I think the, the booster club kind of took most of the time, um, you know, on the, on the larger side, I think it's a bigger project for us to develop a, a overarching fundraising group. Um, but we are working on that. Um, I do know that there are um, groups out there that have begun fundraising for specific things. And, and I would just urge those folks to either attend one of our athletics meetings or attend a Dresden meeting to kind of start getting that on the books. Um, but I know as my, my position as the chair of that committee is to update the board that um, we are aware that um, there is a group of folks um, that are beginning to raise funds or at least discuss raising funds towards uh, the baseball field um, because it, 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 it is a, it is in need. Um, we, you know, Tony came um, and gave us an update on facilities and we've been lucky, I guess, this year in that we're in the middle of a drought. So the baseball field has been pretty dry and very playable. Um, that could change any day now. Um, you know, so I think that that's one uh, thing that should be on the minds of board members moving forward, that this process is is being pushed by a, a group of folks that, that recognize the need for it. But also our committee has specified that it is one of the priorities uh, moving forward of athletics and the district to upgrade that facility, um, as well as the track. Um, Tony also updated us that the track, um, you know, is definitely coming close to the end of its life, if not at the end of its life. And I think that's a little bit different than what we were hearing over the last few months. Um, I think this spring really highlighted a lot of the deficiencies within the facility. Um, so he's bringing in an outside um, independent company to, to really take a look at the track and come up with what the plan would be. Um, but I, I would assume that's another area that's going to come to us at some point. Um, and um, the last thing that we discussed was uh, Jay discussed potentially building a, a piece of our website that could provide updates um, on what facilities we have in athletics, kind of who owns what, what belongs where, um, where they are in, in kind of their needs. Um, and, and just to kind of, you know, give that level of transparency to folks on what the facilities pieces really look like around the district. Um, so uh, Megan and Tony are going to work with Karen on that to start to develop that, that, um, that page. Um, as I said, the next meeting is Thursday, May 20th at 8.15 a.m. Um, I 
think those are kind of the highlights of it. Any questions? Jamie. Just a small addition. Um, we're bringing in an expert on track density also to check the condition of the track for similar to what we did with the turf field as it got you know more more elderly in its years of use if you will um you know they can do similar uh, density tests on tracks as well so i believe that's one of the other folks that he's bringing in thanks jamie uh kim you had another committee update yes are there any other questions for john's update yeah john i just wanted to give one more um kind of reminder to board members, but also the public, um, and we kind of saw this example at the beginning of this meeting, that any gifts that are given to, um, whether it's a team or the whole department, um, any gifts of those, if they're above $1,000, have to come to the board. Um, so we do need to be made aware of that. Um, and they do require board approval. Um, so I, I do want to make sure that the, the community is aware of that. I know there, um, there is a lot of support out there for for our teams, and, and that's fantastic. We just want to make sure it's going through the appropriate channels um, as we move forward. And and also any gifts, um, if the, let's say it's a gift in kind, um, those do become property of the district once they are donated. Uh, Jamie and then Ben. <laughs> that's correct. Uh, what John stated unless the clubs have their own EIN number and they're not operating under ours. So, so there's a one little nuance there. If, if gifts are being made to clubs whose monies are not held underneath our accounts and our um, employer ID number with regards to taxation, if they're a separate 501c3 corporation or C7, um, then if it's if the donation's given to them and not directly to the school district, it's a little bit different about the approval process. I think Ben's probably raising his hand to say that they're going to be looking at this in policy committee. Um, ben, is that what you're going to? Uh, yes, um, when John brought this to our attention, we agreed to discuss it at the next policy meeting for next week. And um, that information about the EIN number was was new to me. So that, that might be discussed a little bit. Um, so we will keep you posted. And that policy that John pointed out has not been updated since 2002. So we'll probably have some other comments to find in there also. So you'll hear from us shortly on that. Not much has changed in the world since 2002. No, nothing. <laughs> Um, yeah, and I think part of the nuance between what you're talking about, John, and what you're talking about, Jamie, may be things that are that become property of the district, and we have some of those things, and then some things that go directly to students, student athletes, and never become property of the district. So I think those are some of the nuances that the policy committee is going to be looking at in in some of this policy creation. Um, Tom, question for John. It's in addition to this discussion about gifts too, because it's come up before and with regard to the policy committee looking at it, I think we also have to be wary of potential Title IX concerns too, because if one of the teams receives a large gift and the other one isn't equally supported, then we need to figure out whether we can either accept the gift or fund the other team in equal measure. Um, and in some cases, I think it's it has come up in the past few years where I don't think we were able to accept a gift because we couldn't fund the other uh, team through the budget at that time. That's a great point, yeah. Um, ben, did you have something else you wanted to add to this? No, okay. Um, Kim, I haven't forgotten you. <laughs> Thanks. Um, my updates are never as exciting as athletics. Um, but uh, so I just have an update, which actually I sort of gave at the Hanover Finance or at the Hanover School Board meeting. Um, it's about uh, the Hanover Finance Committee, which in Dresden um, has been acting as the Dresden Finance Committee with the Norwich Finance Committee in absentia. Um, so what I just want to share for, for this board is that I know we are undergoing negotiations this year and the Hanover Finance Committee um, discussed and they would like um, to offer their help in, in some way, the, at least what was discussed at the Hanover Finance Committee meeting that was last held 
um, was to help with number crunching, kind of understanding this retirement, unfunded retirement issue that we we have had um, or facing in New Hampshire and um, you know potentially in Vermont as, as we looked um, for those issues as well. Um, and so I had discussed that this is something that the Hanover Finance Committee is looking into at the Hanover School Board meeting. And Jamie mentioned that um, uh, it was contemplated at the time that the Finance Committee would kind of crunch numbers and report at a school board meeting in a public forum. Um, and that uh, Jamie mentioned that there is an opportunity if the school boards wanted to go down that route to actually include members such as the finance committee um, into a negotiation process. I understand that there are certain, um, you know, kind of very st strict legal structures around that. And so I just um, wanted to present, I guess, um, that there's a discussion going on and that um, there would be potentially as a board may um, want to consider if, and frankly, the finance committee needs to think about if they want to be included in the process as well. So basically an offer on both sides, um, but that's kind of where we last stand on, on that. And that's really my, um, my update um, on finance. Thanks. Thanks, Kim. Any questions for Kim? Okay, any other committee or liaison updates this evening? Tom, sorry. <laughs> uh, that's all right. With potential apologies for stepping on Kelly Hersey's toes here, but I was previously the uh, Hartford Area Career and Tech Center's uh, representative on the Regional Advisory Board. I'm not sure if this is the right place, but I did want to recognize that there the longtime um, director of the Tech Center, Doug Heavysides, announced that he's stepping down uh, from the Tech Center, but that's uh, just, be, it's the Tech Center's loss because he's moving over to the Wilder School in uh, the Hartford School District. And just wanted to recognize what a great uh, administrator he's been for the past nine years at the Tech Center. He's really done amazing work there. I've seen it firsthand. Um, he's beloved by students and staff there who refer to him as H, and uh, he's just done things I can't even describe uh, how phenomenal um, the uh, efforts uh, he has put in and the staff he has built up there and the programs that he provides the students who go there. So just wanted to recognize that and maybe at the end of the school year when he leaves a position, we could send uh, a note of thanks over from the, uh, the district at that time too. Thanks, Tom. Yes, Kelly. Thank you, Tom, uh, very much. Not stepping on toes at all. I really wish I had stepped up first and thought about that, but I, I can't agree uh, more strongly after having seen what the students produce every year and listening to the students one-on-one. -on -one. The man is phenomenal and the program has blossomed for his efforts. So thank you, Tom, very much. I simply was not making the report because we hadn't had a meeting between the last resident, but that's much more important than a meeting response. Thank you. Thanks, Kelly. Any other uh, committees or liaisons? Okay. Um, moving on to the communication of the chair. I don't have much to communicate. I know that Jay has a few state level updates, so I will let him do those. Um, I did just want to remind everyone that the first of our um, community DEI meetings uh, available to the public are coming up on Thursday. Um, and Lisa has told me that, um, that there's plenty of room still in those. Um, so if anyone, um, the, the turnout uh, or the registrations are, are good, very high, um, but there's still room. So if anyone on the board or in the public um, had forgotten, uh, there's still time to register. Lisa? Um, yeah, just um, we, when we talked to the people who are doing this at Groundswell Change, we said to expect between 20 and 40 people per workshop. And we have over 160 who are currently registered. Um, and because it's on Zoom, the beauty of Zoom is we're pretty unlimited. I think we can host up to 400 people. So if anyone is interested, please join us. Um, it's the next two Thursday nights at seven o'clock. The presentation is about an hour in length, and then um, Brian and Theodosia Cook have agreed to stay on for an extra half hour to do a question and answer session with anyone in the community about 
your questions around DEI. Um, and I wanted to give a shout out if I could um, to Blue Sparrow Kitchen and Lou's. They are providing discounted boxed dinners for people to make it easy for them to attend. So you can go pick your kid up from school, take them to their baseball or lacrosse game, um, stop by Lou's or Blue Sparrow Kitchen, pick up dinner and sit down in front of the Zoom while your kids do their homework is you know how everyone's Thursdays go and that's how smooth it will be. But that is the plan and the hope that um, we're just trying to make it as easy as possible for people to attend. The content will reflect what the teachers are learning this year or have been doing in their professional development. So hopefully we'll all have a better understanding of the conversations that the teachers and staff have been having in their monthly professional development. So thank you. And with that, I will hand it over to, I believe it's Jay first. <laughs> Great, thanks very much. So I have a few things to go over quickly, hopefully quickly. Uh, the first is I just, I just wanted to mention our decision-making around um, school cancellation on Monday. Um, it, it was certainly not an easy decision, but um, I, I'm, I'm pleased that uh, the COVID committee and the principals um, sort of teed that up as a possibility. We'd seen similar cancellations um, necessary to other districts when they had mass um, immunizations like that. And, um, and sure enough, we had, we had just too many teachers that, and, and uh, support staff who were ill to safely operate the schools. There, were, there was some thought that, that one of the schools might be able to stay open, but, but when we look across how many families have kids in multiple schools, it, it made the most sense for us to sacrifice the day. And we'll figure out how, how to, to handle that, as I mentioned earlier, in terms of um, student day accounting and, uh, and, and teacher days. Um, one blip, um, someone pointed out, I forget now, I've been in so many meetings, somebody pointed out that we, we haven't had to have a mass cancellation for actual COVID cases. I think it was you, Kelly, maybe, um, who pointed out that we haven't had to cancel for actual COVID cases, but we had to for the, the vaccination. So. Um, but that's the second dose for our New Hampshire folks. And um, we're, we really have a very high percentage of our, our staff that I believe have, have um, received vaccines. And uh, I'm guessing that Robin will comment on that later. Um, the other thing I wanted to go over quickly by, because I'm obligated to is the, <laughs> the annual title insurance uh, assurances. So in order for us to participate in federal programs, um, both the superintendent and the, and the board chair has to initial on, on all of the required assurances that will comply with all of the relevant uh, federal programs and laws uh, that make us eligible to receive and, and uh, use these funds. So uh, attached to the agenda tonight, I, I've put them there for your review, but um, I'm just gonna quickly run down through them. Uh, Jamie pointed out that these are, these are very important uh, with everything from compliance with a wide variety of, of federal laws, but it, probably more um, pragmatically from the standpoint of proper procurement procedures. So we will be having a much more in-depth review with folks that are involved in that process with our staff. Um, but in the meantime, here goes my whirlwind review of the general assurances. So the general assurances part um, is, is actually about, let's see, 38 separate um, compliance statements. And so when we, when we initial these pages, um, uh, board chair and superintendent, we're agreeing that we have the legal authority to apply for federal aid, that uh, we will, I'm only gonna do a few of these, but we'll, we will have proper audits, that we will um, maintain uh, proper engineering supervision should we have a construction project, uh, that we will maintain ethics or several items that, that uh, have to do with conflict of interest. Um, there are a, a number of legal assurances, uh, everything from Title VI, Title IX, Section 504, the Age Discrimination Act, all of those policies that we currently have enshrined in our A series of policies for um, all of our districts. Uh, those are all in already in policy and this these assurances say that we have those um, as a matter of policy. Um, there, I mean, every 
everything you can think of Hatch Act, um, the Laboratory Animal Welfare Act of 1966, the Lead-Based lead Paint Poisoning Prevention Act, um, the, let's see, all the single audit requirements, um, the Trafficking Victims Protection Act. So again, you can review these uh, um, when you're looking for some fun reading, uh, but there are 40 of these general assurances that, that we must comply with and must indicate our compliance with. The rest of it has to do with uh, grants management requirements. And so it, it, this is where um, when Jamie and I speak with the involved folks, it's really, this is the, the, the nuts and bolts for them. It's about our financial management systems, um, about proper controls, written policies and procedures, which, which we have dealt with steadily for ever since um, I think Jamie and I have been here, uh, ensuring that we have all those things covered for our audits. Um, it addresses internal controls. It tells us what allowable costs are and lays out what the requirements for an audit are. And then uh, it goes into reports that must be submitted. And that's where the federal government and the st our state government that, that has its um, duty to implement these federal programs has the specific RSAs that are applicable as well. Um, another uh, drug-free workplace. Um, all the general education provisions that are that deal with equity for students, teachers, and other program beneficiaries are part of the management piece. Uh, gun possession, which will be a nice segue into my next uh, report, but um, gun possession uh, talks about the Gun Free Schools Act, and the LA, LA, the LEA then assures that it shall comply with the provisions of RSA 193.13.3, which certainly precludes students from possessing firearms uh, in a safe school zone. Um, but I'm gonna talk, talk about a proposed piece of legislation that, that is almost, appears to be to me to be in conflict with this um, and talks about any students that are um, expelled because of a zero tolerance situation with a weapon. Um, there's a lobbying disclosure that's required and then it gives us a list of prohibited activities and um, and essentially there's a, there's a few more, there's protected prayer in public schools. And um, again, uh, everything from purchasing and procurement to retention and access of records and uh, transfer of disciplinary records. There's, there's a pretty long list there in the, in the 17 page document. So I have fulfilled my obligation to the state in reviewing this with you and um, bringing this for consideration by the board and Kelly will next be required to initial every page of this um, and, uh, and make sure that you initial it and don't simply put a check mark like I did one year and then had the entire thing sent back and had to do it over again. Um, so that's the general assurances. The last thing I have is um, a, actually a member of the community brought this to my attention. Um, in, the, in the flurry of legislation that's under review right now in, in Concord, um, there is a House bill that is House Bill 307, which is an act relative to the state preemption of the regulation of firearms and ammunition. So it's the language in this, this bill um, essentially asserts that only the state can regulate firearms in, um, in New Hampshire. And it, um, it's, it's actually known as the New Hampshire Second Amendment State Preemption, uh, Preemption Act. And it applies to firearms, ammunition, and knives. And the, the 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 key elements of this particular piece of legislation are that no public entity um, can can pass any po policy or attempt to regulate the sale, use, or possession of firearms, ammunition, ammunition components, knives, firearms components, firearms accessories, and firearm supplies. Um, and and lays out uh, penalties for that. Uh, which which are up to and including firing a superintendent or s similar public official who attempts to do this or to to uh, to try to thwart this legislation. Why it's particularly of concern to us, uh, or at least of interest to us, is that um, this this board, previous board um, in Dresden, if you recall, some of you will recall that this was a, a pretty um, serious issue that demanded a great deal of our time 
as we thought about the prospect of people bringing guns, I think at the time we were concerned on voting day that um, there were some entities out there that were talking about showing, you know, showing up to, to um, exercise their second amendment rights and bring firearms into the school during voting. And there's really nothing right now in New Hampshire law that precludes any citizen. And if you read this, the language of this bill, you'll see this, um, there's nothing to stop them from carrying weapons, uh, actually holding a weapon. Uh, so it's not just keeping it holstered or, or secured. Um, and uh, we're, we, we are not allowed to regulate that. Our resolution urged the governor and the legislature um, to keep to, to comply with the federal law and keep weapons off school premises. Um, this is this is telling us not to even try to do any any sort of regulation like that. We we fell short. If you recall, we had a pretty lengthy back and forth months worth of uh, investigating this issue, uh, getting legal opinions, and in the end, we felt we stopped short of making our own local regulation. Um, but urged the governor and the legislature to um, to allow us to keep weapons off the, the campus. I have said, and I'll say again publicly tonight, that if I see anybody with a firearm attempting to enter our, our um, schools, we will go into a complete lockdown. Um, and we'll look at how, we, we have to be careful now with this new legislation that we don't go the next step, which is to involve law enforcement and attempt to do some sort of, sort of round uh, end around with a, a trespass charge or something. Um, if should this pass, uh, we will have to confer with attorneys to see what what we can do to keep our students safe. Um, so I personally believe that the firearms there's no, there is absolutely no reason, short of of um, law enforcement first responder people uh, coming on on campus. There's absolutely no reason for weapons to be on our premises, and. Um, so I've been urged by this member of the public to oppose this legislation individually. I brought it to the board for your review. Uh, if we do decide that we wanna weigh in on it, you certainly can weigh in on your own, um, but uh, this is one to watch for sure. And um, other than that, um, I, I just wanna add, I, I, when, we, when we report out from our committees, um, it's, it's a, a pretty big change from when I got here that there's so much activity going on in our committees and I'm really, I applaud the work that all of you have done and previous chairs have done to, um, to sort of reinvigorate our committee work. It's super helpful to us administratively to have you volunteering your time to help us with everything from finance to policy to equity and all the things that people are liaisons for, but it's, it's really, really helpful. And, um, and I, I just wanna thank you. Many of the, the committees are SAU committees or other board committees, and many of you are serving on multiple uh, committees and, and giving so much of your time, um, which I'm, I'm probably lengthening right now. But, um, but Tom and I trained yesterday for Norwich uh, to comply with the law. So thank you so much for all the time you give. Uh, it's, it's, it's much appreciated. And with that, I'm done. Thank you, Jay. Any questions for Jay? All right. Um, I Sorry, Jamie, before we turn to you, I realized, Jay, as you were talking, that we did not put um, our wonderful assistant superintendent on there. Um, Robin, I know you updated us on curriculum. Did you have anything else that you wanted to share with us tonight? I can give you a little COVID update. We are opening things up a little bit more and we have been planning for the prom and graduation as Jim spoke about. And we've been working very closely with the town on those events and also the spring play. Um, and then, as you know, we did have to call school on Monday. We had planned in preparation for that. I looked at all the numbers and got the data from public health about um, Lebanon and how many people ended up being out after their vaccination clinic. So I had a pretty good idea of what we were looking at in terms of numbers and asked the principals to put something in their newsletter so we would be prepared for that. And I asked people to call in by three o'clock on Sunday so we'd have a good idea. 
So uh, people were very happy in the schools today that they had received their second doses. We have very high numbers. I had close to 400 people that signed up for the clinic. Many people got vaccinated outside of that before the clinic even happened. So all is going well on the COVID front at this point. And knock on wood, we hope it continues through Friday. <laughs> Thanks very much, Robin. Jamie, oh, sorry, Kelly had a question before we get to. I'm so sorry, Jamie. Poor Jamie's always at the end of the end of the meeting. Kelly, go ahead. I just wanted to say, Robin, thank you so much. I, you know, I called you when I received the email, thinking that it surely wasn't for the board as well. But as a board member from Vermont, your efforts to get us vaccinated as well was so appreciated. So thank you. That's it. You are so welcome. <laughs> Jamie. Kelly, how are you? <laughs> Tired, how are you? <laughs> awesome. <laughs> so yes, there's a lot of reports for you. That's in an effort to be transparent with all of our information. No, I'm not going to go over all of them tonight because these are our quarterlies. Yes, there is an end of year projection there, which is the second one over on the right, um, along with an unaudited surplus projection. Uh, so the first two reports are the most important ones to take a look at. Uh, what I can say is I've gone through and added encumbrances um, into the projection lines and uh, based on spending history and patterns, um, I've probably encumbered more than what will actually be spent down. Um, but I like to be cautious at this point because through March 31st, we would not have shut down normal purchasing yet. Um, when we bring you the May uh, updates on all of this, I'll do a full narrative so you know you can read through it and not have to listen to me. Um, and then you can formulate questions. We'll get that out to you earlier. I'm sorry, I apologize. It's been super busy in my office. Um, and give you more time to look at it in depth and then formulate any questions at the May meeting. So as of now, revenues are off. We knew they would be in tuition. Kids are coming and going every day, changing. Um, but we should end in a, um, we'll meet our goals for the projected surplus offset uh, into the 21-22 um, budget year, barring any unforeseen emergency situations that might arise between now and June 30. Um, and there should be monies left there to be able to retain into the next year. So take a look at the reports. <clears throat> if you have any questions, feel free to send me an email. If you do and I answer anything, I'll share it with everybody and I'll post the questions um, also on the board docs here. In addition to that, there's a copy of the finalized audit. Finally, we <laughs> took a long time. Uh, hopefully next year, non-COVID, we can get this out sooner than later. Uh, there were no surprises. We had shared with you earlier the drafts of the numbers that we thought we'd end up with. Uh, no surprise on general fund. We came out where we thought we would, uh, and we retained based on that accordingly. Uh, again, we'll share this information with the Hanover Finance Committee at a special meeting that they normally um, invite us to. We'll make sure everybody knows about when that's going to be done. So if they want to attend, um, our auditing firm will attend and answer any questions directly um, at that meeting. Um, I've posted the governance information for the board um, and we'll, once we've reviewed that with the principals, um, we can probably let most of that information out. Some of it might need to be redacted just because it has to do with technology and policies and we don't want to put ourselves at risk um, of anything. I think that's all that's posted there, right? And food service, we'll have an update on food service. Um, if you look at the food service reports, please don't be frightened. Um, the encumbrances show throughout the entire end of fiscal year, whereas the projection of revenue through the fiscal end of fiscal year is not there. So it'll, it'll look like we're running really scary behind, but we're not. That's it. 
Thank you so much, Jamie. I, as always, we, you know, you give us this list of documents and I can only imagine the hours and hours and hours of work that goes into putting it all together for us. So thank you. Um, Kim, was your question around the food service? It, it was. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Super. I saw your hand go down. Thank you. Um, and I did, I just had one question because I know that we've asked this question in Hanover, um, and it's not really directly for Jamie per se, but do we have any kind of sense of whether students that we, that decided to go elsewhere this year might be returning to the district next year? Mm -hmm. Or is it too early to, to know that? I'm judging by the fact that no one's answering that it might be too early to know. We we have had just anecdotally, we've had uh, a number of people ask about the tuition, just to be perfectly honest, just because the housing market is so tight in Norwich and Hanover that people who are trying to get into the district can't. Uh, and so they're looking into, well, if I buy here, can I then tuition in? So mm -hmm. um, I think we've, we feel that a fair number of those more so than uh, you know, in my huge experience, but uh, from what Robin says, we've we've uh, fielded more of those discussions this year. Now they haven't actually committed yet, but they're at least asking the question. Mm -hmm. Great. And I assume we have some sort of survey going out to those families for or enrollment projections for next year, that sort of thing. Registrations coming up before too long. I believe the registration portal is open and I only say that because I was just on the website looking around it for okay. something else. Okay, super. All right, if there are no other questions for Jamie, uh, I will take a motion to enter. Oh, Kim. <clears throat> Forgot my other question. Um, it was um, about the COVID federal fund relief um, how much I asked this question in Hanover. So I guess my question is how much did, are we expecting to receive interest in? Oh, and Miss Kim, I am so not prepared to answer that because I'm not in my office. <laughs> it's okay, um, in Hanover, I think we would be receiving 40,000 and I just kind of a factor on. I believe Dresden, Kim on the CR2 was 70, 71, two, three sticks in my mind for, for the two ESSER two. And so what they've been telling us in New Hampshire, because they haven't um, processed it yet, is that for ESSER 3, you would look towards double that amount. So for ESSER 3, I would assume, um, I could be wrong, it would be about 140 and that would be shared between the both, school both schools within the Dresden District. Great, thank you. Yep. All right. And with that, I will take a motion to enter non-public session. Uh, ben? Move to enter into non-public session under RSA 91-A colon 32B, hiring of personnel. And I'll take a second. Kelly, and a roll call vote starting with Kim. Hartman, yes. Ben? Deanie, yes. Rick? Johnson, yes. Tom? And Neil. Neil? Odell, yes. Brittany? Joyce, yes. Garrett? Tom, yes. John? Hunt, yes. Marcella? Blossy, yes. Kelly? Percy, yes. Lisa? Christy, yes. And McConnell, yes. And just for members of the public, we will be um, coming back just to approve hires, but I don't believe there's any other substantive uh, matters taking place after the non-public, so. Can someone send me the link? I promise to save it this time. <laughs> but this is my favorite part of the meeting, Tim.
right. Getting restarted in public session. Rick decided to join as an attendee instead of a participant, apparently. Yes. Fine that way. I'm okay with that. <laughs> Move him over. All right. Uh, and I think I can take a motion to approve everyone all at once. Trying to move Rick over real fast here. Nope, I can't. I'm not host. That's why. All right, I'll take a motion. Wow. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, Ben. Go ahead. Your name says Kelly McConnell on mine. I don't know why. Ben. I'm trying, I'm trying to upgrade myself. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the board will approve the following new hires and contract changes. RMS 1.0 FTE science teacher. HHS, HHS 1.0 FTE learning specialist. HHS 1.0 math teacher, HHS social studies FTE change, and HHS 1.0 FTE social studies teacher. Thank you, very well, very well read. Uh, second from John. Kelly. And I will take a roll call vote, starting with John. Yes. Kim. Hartman, yes. Uh, Tom, sorry. And and yes. Ben? Keeney, yes. Neil? Odell, yes. Kelly? Marcy, yes. Marcella? Blossy, yes. Lisa? Christy, yes. Brittany? Joyce, yes. And McConnell, yes. And I see Rick's hand up, which is probably what, um, and I actually don't have, I'm not host anymore, so I don't have the power to move him over. So Rick, I see your hand. We, we note it. I don't think we can count it officially, but oh, hey, now I'm host. All right, promote to panelist. Rick, you want to vote? Rick? I have no idea. I just clicked on the link and it keeps on taking me there. So I'm calling it a night. I vote yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Might've been Tim's fault. Thank you, Rick. All right, it is unanimous. And uh, with that, I will take a motion to adjourn. Our next meeting is May 25th. And I'll take a motion to adjourn. Kelly. Move to adjourn at 8.36. Oh, no, I wish. 9.36, 9.36. <laughs> Couldn't see it, yes. 9.36. And I saw a second from Lisa. Do we need to do a roll call vote on this? Oh, sure. Kim. Hartman, yes. John. What? Yes. Garrett. Tom, yes. Tom. Candon, yes. Ben. Eni, yes. Neil. Odell, yes. Kelly. Percy, yes. Marcella. Lisa. Christy, yes. Brittany. Joyce, yes. Rick. Johnson, yes. And McConnell, yes. <laughs> Thank you all. Good night, Good night everyone. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. See you soon.